We're beginning on Standard Baptist time. I should have your attention because you probably wouldn't realise. So welcome as we church this morning. And uh, I should say welcome if people are watching online because people have been watching online. So it's good to be able to join just with the larger uh, family of Jesus and to enjoy and get to know him. I'm going to refrain from embarrassing myself, but it's really hard because I know a joke. And uh, it's strange to start a joke, but the joke is an imitation of a lighthouse. And uh, the joke is this person standing there, and well, I'll do it. I have to do it. So forgive me if you're watching and I don't scream too much. An impersonation of a lighthouse. Move away from the rocks. Move away from the rocks. I said, move away from the rocks. Like that? Our first song is my lighthouse. And the lighthouse does one thing. It's to warn you into it and get you to move out of danger. So, move away from the rocks. Let's uh, stand.
I'd like to start with uh, reading a passage from 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. About a week ago, we had an extra, we gained an extra member of our family. Now all of you start thinking, oh, wasn't a baby person. It was a baby pussycat. Yeah, we, my daughter and I went to the pound oh, just over a week ago and Leanne wanted to get a little cat for Loxley, so this was supposed to be a surprise for him, so we went over and we um, actually started and Leanne saw on the, um, the animal shelters, Facebook I think it was, uh, this picture of this little black and white lady cat, only four, uh, eight, eight weeks old, so she said, okay, I'm going to get that for Loxley, so we went over and bought this little bundle of fur home and of course I, I had a grandpa had to have a nurse and what while well, I this this put a cat you know just barely fits into my hand you know this, <coughs> this fragile delicate little creature you know just so helpless so little and, and as I sat holding it you know, I just sort of, the thought occurred to me that, you know, we love, the amount of love you put into something like this, you want to protect it, you want to feed it, you want to shelter it, you want to keep it from harm, and, and you just, it's not in you to hurt it, you don't want to, I mean, it's so small, I could have just gone like that, done away with it, but I couldn't do something like that, because you have love, out for this little creature. And as I was thinking about it, and I sort of thought about God's love for us. God loves us so much, he doesn't want us to be, I guess, he wants to look after us, he wants to nourish us, he wants to feed us and care for us and provide for us. He doesn't want harm to come our way. And that's got, and he, he loved us so much as we read here that he sent Jesus to be the propitiation, or in other words, the atoning sacrifice for us. That's his great love for us. Well, in, I think it's in uh, Ezekiel. It says, As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? God's love for us is that he doesn't want to see us perish. He doesn't want us to see us spend our eternity in torment. Even though we might rebel against him, disobey him and, and ignore him, even deny that he exists, his love is still there for everyone. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But it was good just to have that little animal just in my hands. And as I, I guess, poured out my love and care for this little creature, in the same way, God pours out his love and care for each of us. And it's up to us of how we respond to God's love. We can either reject him or we can accept his love and be submissive to him and obedient to him love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you. Your word tells us that you are love. You are love from everlasting to everlasting. And we just come to worship you and to give you thanks for that great love that you have for us.
I just pray, Lord, that you help us to be obedient to you and take the appropriate response of your love to us. And I just pray, Lord, as we worship you and praise you as we look into your word this morning, that you just will reveal more and more of your love to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. He's got a really soft side, doesn't he? <laughs> Not that we've got hearts when we go back, but that no, we just pull on you see that soft side. Well, by way of announcements, you uh, will have seen on the screen about our Bible Studies Craft Group, Coffee Time. Just on Coffee Time, if you uh, have time on Tuesday morning, would like to meet us up at Pilpin outside the primary school at 8.30, you are more than welcome. And uh, as we sort of share coffee and then we come down here and we serve up our ladies more hot chocolates than coffee but hot chocolates and coffee and do you know how cruel it is to actually for me to have to make coffees and chocolate and hand them into you ladies like while well, i'm not allowed to have coffee and chocolate <laughs> hope you will i hope you appreciate the sacrifice <laughs> anyway our prayer meeting as you know now we had our um our, our youth on uh Shortly, you'll see a flyer come out. The draft has already been done, and then uh, we'll be moving. So, not Christmas or carols in the park, but carols at home. And uh, Glenis, do you want to just uh, update us with Angel Tree? Last year, we commenced the ministry of Angel Tree, and most of you would know what that is. But for those that don't, Angel Tree is a ministry where prison fellowship, prison chaplains, and local churches work together to provide gifts for prisoners' children. But we become the blessing, we pass on the gifts. So on the tree, which is up the back of the church, you'll see angels with the children's name, their age, and the requested gift. So you choose the child you'd like to sponsor, and then I'll give you the details of what you need to do to, to prepare the gift and to bring it back so that we can deliver it. So you choose the child and we do the delivery for you or post it and um, you are the blessing to the children. So I hope that, well it's already been three quarters sponsored this morning. So <laughs> thank you Lord. Uh, we have a church uh, meeting next Sunday and we'll be discussing various things. So. Uh, Adherents in good standing are welcome to come along. So straight after morning tea next Sunday, the church meeting. Our offering, as you know, is at the back there, or if you would like to uh, give online, if that's easier, then see Ron and he can give you the information there. Well, when you can't sing, what do you do? Well, let's uh, stand together and shout to the Lord.
Elizabeth is going to bring our Bible reading to us, which comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Um, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which has been renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray as we look at God's word together. Father God, as we have just heard your word, and yes, indeed, they are your words, I pray, God, that we would hear you speaking and that you would recreate in us the new life that, that we've been called into and have been placed in, in Jesus. So, Lord, help me to speak clearly, but help us to actually strip back those things that don't belong to us anymore and to take on that new characteristic that represents and reflects the image of your son who is holy and blameless and spotless so through the spirit lord may you work in us as we read together your word i pray in jesus name amen when we're talking about the supreme life and we get down to the reality of that there is a real danger over the years of, uh, within Christianity because a lot of us were taught or we took on and we thought that being a Christian was about not doing things about getting rid of things about putting off certain habits and behaviours and so the danger is what we'll do is try and reform ourselves we'll try to actually you know, sort of push away things that we know are bad but we try and be someone that, you know, by our own energy, is very difficult to be. So I guess the danger is that we do what's called sin management. We try and manage our sinfulness. We try and manage those things or characteristics in us that are not pretty. And so we'll come up with lots of different strategies of managing sin. And another thing that we'll do just to back that up is, as a church, we'll actually sin manage each other. Almost like peer pressure. And it 
becomes very, very frustrating. Because there is this darkness that still is within us that just keeps creeping through. And so we suppress, we push it down. We try and hold it at bay or put a leash on it so it can't get out of control, so that no one actually sees my anger, so that no one actually hears my language, that no one sees what's in my heart until I get tired and hungry and worn out. And suddenly what's in my heart bubbles up out of my mouth. Now, church is really easy. I can keep all that aside. And for any of you who live with someone else, you know that sin management, trying to keep a leash or pushing that, doesn't work very well. When someone, you live side by side with someone, be it your children or your spouse or, you know, a relative or whoever you share with, they'll see you for who you really are. So let me just start by saying on the negative, that we are not, as disciples of Jesus, talking about sin management. We're not talking about just putting to death. So the beginning is the pattern, and we looked at chapter 1, verse 15, of Jesus. And it was like he is the image, the perfect reflection of God. And we know that the Bible describes God as perfectly holy, pure and spotless. Every word that came out of his mouth was truth. So all through the Gospels, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, there's no lies, there's no distortions. There's no stretching and there's no, no sort, of, sort of sidestepping. He tells the truth. But also, he has seen what God is like. He's had that picture of heaven. And so we begin, since you have been raised with Jesus, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand. And then he says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. There's two parts. There's one is our heart. And so this sort of summary version in these two verses, well, it's verse 3 there, but in these two verses, this summary says, you need to picture, you need to set your mind, and you need to set your heart. So where are these settings? Settings are interesting because, you know, when you lay concrete, it's, it's actually quite pliable and malleable and, and it's wet. And as anybody knows, the old image, when you lay the concrete and before it's dry, someone runs across and then it dries with those footprints in it, the cat prints, the dog prints, the kid prints, and, and it's set. And that's where it is, set in stone. And so the idea of setting or casting your heart is our first call there. Cast your heart. That means, in a sense, you are setting your heart, the very passions and desire of who you are, you're setting your heart firmly in the heavenlies, in the presence of, verse 15 of chapter 1, where Jesus is. Something that was quite beautiful and that Pauline imparted in her funeral because she gave me that, that Psalm 55, that she longed to be in the dwelling courts of her Lord. She longed to be in the presence. And I think one of the things we miss, I guess this is going to sound strange, the beauty of aging as our outwardly body, and we become very discontent with this world. Because no longer can we run, jump, and play like we used to be. No longer can we think like we used to. No longer can we enjoy tastes and smells. No longer. And, and suddenly it's like, I don't like being here anymore. There is something better. And this is a leading to how we not sin, sin manage. We set our heart, our, our desire, our passion for the best. To be in the presence of God. And then we set our minds so we start to think like heaven. We start to think like it would be to live in the presence of God. And when Jesus said, thy kingdom come, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're bringing and we're acting on earth the same way we would act in heaven. We are this new community with different rules and different regulations. And as Bill sort of pointed out, 
Those regulations are actually fashioned in the purest of love, where our intent is for the, the not just the best, but the glory of one another, that we would share with one another everything that is in Jesus. His grace, his mercy, and we'll see that a little bit later. So set your minds, set your hearts, because, he says there, since you have been raised, so there's this counterpart, you, you die. And that's an image of what happens in reality. We die, and we are resurrected to be in the presence of God. But we didn't die on the day that we died as Christians. Take that to heart. We did not die on the day that we died. So on our tombstones, born on the 20th of April, 1962, died whatever date. Oh, no, I actually died a long time ago. And I was resurrected into Jesus, into heaven, a long time ago. A lot of us wait to die before we live. Since you have been raised, that's going, all right, so you did die and you've been raised into Jesus. Now set your heart on your real home, on that place that you have been called into and placed into, heaven. Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We live like we're in heaven. So this is what we're called to. Set your heart, set your mind, for you died and your life is now hidden it's cloaked in Jesus. And look what he says there. And when Christ, who is your new life or your life, appears, then you will also appear in glory. Don't you remember when we went through 2 uh, Corinthians and it talked about the glory of God actually infused into us and we've been changed from glory into glory into glory. Daily, the renewing or the glorifying of us. So, as Christians, we don't just manage our sin, control it, leash it. Yes, we do put to death. But let me say, as I go through this point, this is not the most important part. So we do put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to our old or our earthly. And look at the characteristics of our earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. These are old. And our workings of that, or, or maybe it's the inward workings of that, which in verse 80 says is anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language and lying to each other. So these are characteristics of our world that we used to live in, that we used to be part of. And what's really bizarre is you have not only died spiritually, but we physically put off the characteristics of that old life. So put to death, therefore, whatever belonged, past tense, to your earthly nature. And there is still hints of it there. So even though we try to put these things off, and we actually make a conscious habit of putting these things behind us, even though we are putting them off, even though we are putting them to death, that is not the essence of who we are. We're not about, we're not executioners, as it were. We are not people who just go about our whole life stopping doing this and stopping doing that and stopping doing that and stopping doing that. If you spend your life trying to stop everything, you will become incredibly not only frustrated, but when you realise that you can't win that fight by sheer <coughs> will and discipline alone, you'll start to fake it till you make it. You'll start to pretend that you're something that you're not. And that frustration as you pretend and that inward hypocrisy will actually destroy you if you stop just there. He said, you used to walk in, in these ways, in the life you once lived. So you don't put off 
We are not characterized by the fact of by the things we do not do. We had a, uh, a, a funeral in my family many years ago, and I was a new minister, so to speak. I officiated because it was a family member, and I got home, and in the front room, all the Christians were, which just happened to be all my sisters. And as you know, I've got five brothers. But my sister, my, the Christians are in the, in, the, in the kitchen, and not just cooking, but chatting, etc., etc. And all the non-Christian, the blokes, my brothers, are out I'm in the shed. And in the shed was the fridge and was the beer. And I'm with the Christians. Because that's who I am. And I'm like, I need to go and spend some time with my brothers. And I went out to my brothers. And I said to Bernie, can I can grab a beer? Now let me just say, at that point I never used to drink at all. Never. Because Christians, what? We don't drink. So I never touched down. I said, hey, can I have a beer? And you know what he said? I'm going to a Christian. Now, what characterized a Christian to him? Christians do not drink. Is that what a Christian is? Someone who does not? Well, let's, let's move on. So we did that. Right there. Oh, I've got to jump, sorry. Therefore, verse 12, as God's chosen people, Holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves. Now this is what a Christian is. This is the new life. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. And before I go on, listen to what my brother said. I thought you were a Christian. What marked a Christian? You don't drink. You don't smoke. If you're Baptist, you don't dance. You don't. You don't. Therefore, Paul said in verse 12, as God's chosen people, holy and dear love, put on, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. How embarrassing that he didn't say, oh, I can see your compassion to want to have a beer with me. I can see your compassion. I can see your gentleness and your patience. Like, that's not what he was looking for. Bear with one another and forgive one another. Any grievances you have against, forgive in the same way that God has forgiven you. And over all these virtues, bind them together in perfect unity. Let me come to a dressing sort of, uh, uh, sort of picture. Because he says, put off, put on. Clothe yourselves. And let me add it to, we die, but we live now in Jesus. So as God's, um, as God's chosen, holy, so you are holy, you are dearly loved, now put on, clothe yourself. So it's that imagery of getting dressed. So you actually wear. So in other words, what everybody sees in you, is this compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. They see us being forgiving and gracious. Or do they? Forgiving grievances <coughs> in the same way that we've been forgiven. So if all of those characteristics we're putting on, they're sort of undergirding, as it were, underneath all of this, and over the top, Put on love. Because again, it's not just actions we're looking for. It is being clothed, fully dressed, not in compassion and gentleness, but fully dressed in love. Over all of this, you could switch it around like this. Because I love, I am compassionate, gentle, patient, kind. All of those fruits of the Spirit. So you've got two things happening, not sin management. See, the problem is, if we just work on what we're putting off and don't live in what we've put on, you end up being like a rouser. You'll be not only personally frustrating, 
but externally without this love. Because what did Paul say? If I give everything I have to the poor, but I don't have love, I'm just nothing. If you haven't, if you're not driven by this same love that drove Jesus, then the world's going to look and go like, how are you any different other than you're a do good and you're just trying to be, you just don't drink and don't smoke and don't dance and don't do this and don't do this, rather than seeing what we do do. Over these virtues, everything that underpins who we are, put on love which holds everything together in perfect unity. So we put off and we put on. We dress in those clothes, that righteousness, that holiness that God has actually presented to us or given to us. You notice something? You don't create the holiness. But God, in verse 15 on, when we went through this verse, the creator, the Jesus, the creator, the image of God, he created our holiness. He created our righteousness. You don't create it. You just put it on. Here's a new dress. Here's a new shirt. Here's a new clothes. Put them on. You don't have to create it. You don't have to energize and go like, I have to be loving. I have to be patient. You don't do that. Just put on. It's you're putting on something, a gift that you say, oh, wow. Let the peace, verse 15, of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of the one body, you were called to peace and thankfulness. This whole peace, because it flows out of the putting off and then the putting on, this whole peace comes out of this rest. The peace rules. See, you're not fighting your old self. You're not fighting to get rid of the anger. And I know, I think this is part of the problem we've had when we try to reform our characters. When we just try to correct it. When we try to keep it under control. You can't be at peace when you're fighting. But you can accept something that is given to you that is yours and you have, and relax. And relax. So I wanted to just quickly look at how. The how on this is quite interesting because how do you put it on? So we put off or we put on, but what actually is it that builds that character? Let me just say by way of sort of putting this in context, that we're talking about maturity. Now, I've defined maturity so far as two things, knowledge. At the beginning of Paul's prayer of this, in chapter 1, I pray that you will know, and wisdom, and that you will discern. And now we're coming to a third part of our maturity, as it were, is our characteristics, our actual character. So it's not just putting off and putting on. How do you physically do this? Well, in, in 3.12, God's chosen, holy and loved. So firstly, we accept the gift that has been given to you. Okay? Putting on love. In other words, being loved and then expressing love. So our Christian maturity is not marked by our sins that we do not do anymore, but by a deeper personal knowledge. So that's why Paul prayed at the beginning there in of, uh, Colossians 1, but also in Ephesians 4.13. I pray that your love will abound more and more, how? With knowledge and discernment. He says much the same thing in Philippians 1, chapter 4. I pray that you will abound more and more in love, how? Through knowledge and discernment. There was a problem in the church in, in Colossae. And they thought the more stuff I know, the more secrets I know, the more freer, the more powerful I would be. That's literal. They thought the more stuff I did, the more formulas I filled in, and how 
wanted to find those, listen to the gurus that were now moving into the church in Colossae. And how does Paul answer that? He says, change the word from no, and he says, knowledge of him. It's not what you know, but who you know, and knowing what he has done for you. So his prayer is, I pray that you will know him more, or that in knowledge. So how do you know him more? I should ask for a show of hands, who did their homework this week? Oh, wow. <laughs> Let me just ask them, do you normally do that anyway? <laughs> <laughs> I should now say, so the homework, if you weren't here, was they had to read their Bible, particularly, possibly Colossians, every single day for seven days. I should ask now, who did that for their homework, who doesn't normally read their Bible every single day? But I won't put up. <laughs> I'll just enjoy the majority rules of that first question. But you will know, Paul Cosley says, I am an ambassador, I am a minister of his word. My whole job is to present his word. Why is he so fastidiously presenting the Bible, the Bible, the Bible? Because by knowing his word, you know him. Jesus said, you search the scriptures, and they all point to me. So if you know the Bible, you actually know me. There is this correlation or this unbreakable connection between the Bible and knowing God. So I pray that your knowledge will abound. Not knowledge of stuff, but knowledge of God. And how do you know God? By knowing his word. So that's his prayer. So when we talk about putting off and putting on, and let me tell you what I've learned this last, I think we're up to three weeks, of not just eating whatever I want. I learned something about the Jews. Because if they went to McDonald's and they went to order a, a Big Mac, you know, to all big packet special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, sausages, they'd have to go, you know, well, that, 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 no, I can't have that. Or I learned for someone who's gluten or dairy intolerant, when they've got to read down the direction and go, I can't have that, no, I can't, sorry, it's got dairy. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Constantly, they were reminded. For the Jews, they were reminded of who they were in God. His chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Every time they went to McDonald's or went to a restaurant or went to the supermarket or they had to eat, they were reminded. We are reminded. And, and going in this fast, every time I'm hungry, I just want a bit of sugar or a bit of coke or a bit of coffee. It's like, no, no, no. It's reminding me constantly, almost daily, of this one. The more I'm living in the reminder of who I am in God, do I have time to sin too much? I'm sure I've done stuff. Have I just. <laughs> <laughs> As I said last week, that's because I'm too tired to be crammed. <laughs> but you're reminded, and you start to live in, we don't live by green alone. But every word that proceeds from God said, isn't that what Jesus said when he was fasting? And don't you think his belly was screaming out? His flesh was going, eat, eat. And Satan said, turn that stone into bread. We don't live by bread alone. And so I was suggesting, rather than being a Christian, let's be disciples, discipliners of ourselves. So yes, we put to death. And yes, we put on. But how do you put on? That's why he constantly prays that you will know him. And the second part of that knowing was in his prayer in, say, Philippians 1, verse 4. Knowledge and discernment. Not just knowing the Bible, but discerning the wisdom. He's going, how do I live in the light of that? And to finish, let's go back to where we start. <coughs> I think it's fair. Let the message of Christ, the word of Christ, Dwell in you richly as you teach one another. As you admonish one another. With all wisdom, discernment. So in other words, as you discern together. 
as you teach, admonish one another with wisdom through, now it's not just psalms as in singing, but the psalms are directly words from God's word itself. They were songs, yes, for most of them. Poems and songs. Hymns, which was, a hymn is a recounting, and I'm talking a biblical, not, you know, saying his hymn book or the Baptist hymn book, etc. But a hymn biblically is a remembering or a song that flows out of an action of God. And this historical saving event of God. When God saved Moses, he sang a hymn. So in Exodus you see the hymn of Moses. When Mary received news that she would be with child and he will be the saviour, she sang a hymn. The Bible calls saving acts of God hymns. So as you sing psalms and hymns, saving, remembering saving acts of God and songs from your spirit, which is your response to that, Singing to God, and might I add, it says teach one another, admonish one another, sing to one another, we have done this, with joy in your hearts. How? This wisdom, this maturity only comes in community. Last week we said united in love. You cannot be united on your own. It's together. So let me just, one or two things there. If you are not together, if you are not singing, encouraging, admonishing, reflecting on God's word together, you will not grow. You will not grow. And Paul had said of some Christians, by now you ought to be teachers, but instead you are babies. There is an expectation. And last week I was just talking about the whole thing. Growing in the, is part of the natural DNA of God. So I, I said, we put on. We put on. We put off the characteristics of that old person who is actually dead and buried. Maybe you need to write yourselves an epitaph. I died. And put on the newness. How do you do that? Through God's word and through this communal, this stuff we do together, singing, encouraging, admonishing, teaching one another in all that we bring to, to God. So I'm calling this to grow up.
let's finish and we're going to praise him. The end of that uh, passage said, and to sing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, Corona may not allow you to sing, but I know it's not going to stop you from praising. So let's stand and praise as we finish and then move on to morning tea. Join us as we continue for morning tea, and uh, we'll see you there. Bless you.